So far in this chapter, are an aqueous reactions with two different types of reactions. The first one were called precipitation reactions. And in these kind of reactions, we asked whether the product was soluble or not. Soluble or not was told to us by the solubility rules. And knowing that soluble ionic salts were one of the strong electrolytes. The second type we looked at were acid-base reactions. And in those, we asked the question, is the substance that forms or is the substance that reacts a strong acid or a strong base? Is it a weak acid or weak base, or is it a non-electrolyte? And remember, we memorized the strong acids is hyperhical high, hyperhical low, H2SO4, and the strong bases is being the B forming hydroxides on the periodic table. So those took care of a large component of our strong electrolytes, the soluble ionic salts, and the strong and the weak acids. The third type of reaction we're going to look at in this chapter are called oxidation reduction reactions. And these have to do with a change in the charge of the ions, a change in the charge with the ions from the reactants to the products. So make sure that you have your notes out right here and we'll go to section 4.4, oxidation reduction reactions. What is a redox reaction? A redox reaction is one where we have a change in charge from reactants to products. A change in charge from reactants to products. How do you know if a redox reaction occurred? Well, you look at the charges of the ions on the reactant side and you look at the charge of the products on the product side and you say, was there a change? Was there a change? And the way that we can find out if there's a change or not is by using some arbitrary rules that you'll end up memorizing that can tell you what the charges are of the reactants and what the charges are of the products. After assigning those reactant and product charges, you can say, did they change? So to tell if a redox reaction occurs, we have rules that we have to memorize for assigning oxidation numbers. So rules uh, are outlined for you in your textbook as well, and I'm going to summarize them here in the notes on page 139. Page 139, not sure if that fit in there. Yes, it did. Okay, number one, if an atom is in its elemental form, if it's in its elemental form, it has an oxidation or charge number of zero. Charge number of zero. Examples would be if it was the element aluminum solid, it has a charge of zero. If it was the element zinc, just by itself solid, it would have a charge of zero. Rule number two, for any monatomic ion, monatomic, mono meaning one, atomic meaning one atom, ion, the charge is whatever's on that ion. So for example, if it was aluminum ion, like Al plus three, the charge would be plus three. If it was zinc plus two aqueous, or aluminum a aqueous plus three, it would be a positive two charge here for zinc, positive three for aluminum. Or if it was H plus aqueous in solution, like an acid, the plus right here would mean that it's a positive one charge. The third rule has three parts to it. It says that nonmetals, nonmetals usually have negative oxidation numbers, although they can sometimes be positive. The general rule of thumb, 99% of the time, is that oxygen is minus two, which makes sense because it's in group 16, and we say that in uh, ionic compounds anyway, oxygen is always minus two. And it is, except once in a great while when it's combined with fluorine. General rule of thumb is oxygen is minus two. The one exception that you do need to know about is that sometimes oxygen is minus one in hydrogen peroxide or dihydrogen dioxide. Then it has a minus one charge. Rule B, 3B, is uh, the oxidation number of hydrogen is always plus one when it's with a nonmetal. And it's always negative one when it's with a metal. You don't see it with a metal too often, so this is the rule to really know that hydrogen is almost always positive one. And then lastly, the uh, last rule about nonmetals is that fluorine, this is one of the few always is in chemistry, you don't see very many of them. Fluorine is always minus one. Always minus one. Um, the halogens, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, 
they're almost always minus one as well, except for when they're combined with oxygen. Then they take on a positive charge. So when in doubt, guess minus one for these guys. Ooh, I used the G word. Yes, you sometimes have to guess. Generally, though, these are minus one, except for when they're combined with oxygen and occasionally with something else, but that's about the only time. And then oxygen generally is minus two, and fluorine is almost always minus one. And if you end up having some metals in there, they almost always Always follow these rules where the lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium are, are positive one, and then anything in group two is always positive two as well. It's kind of an unwritten rule that, hey, you guys already know that. Then rule number four is that the sum of the oxidation numbers in a compound or in a, in a neutral compound are always equal to zero, and the sum of the oxidation numbers of an ion always add up to equal whatever the charge is on that ion. For example, if it's SO4 2 minus, the sum of sulfur plus four oxygens has to equal negative two. The sum of NaCl is going to have to add up to equal zero because it's a neutral compound. That's what rule number four says. Okay, so those are the four rules for assigning oxidation numbers. And then they ask us a bunch of questions about applying these rules. So keep these rules out, keep them handy, and we're going to apply them in the next bunch of questions. First of all, it says, what noble, uh, noble gas element has the same number of electrons as fluoride ion? Fluoride ion is F minus one. And what is the oxidation number of that species? Well, if fluoride had one more electron, because remember, if it has a negative charge, a minus one charge, that means it's gained one more electron. If fluorine had one more electron, it would look like the element neon. So, neon is the answer to that first question because neon is a noble gas. And then what's the oxidation number of this species? Well, go back to these rules. If it's just an element by itself, well, it has an oxidation number of zero. So, easy question to start us off with. Next sample question actually has us apply these rules. It says, determine the oxidation number of sulfur in each of the following. H2S. Well, general rule of thumb is that hydrogen is positive one when it's with a nonmetal. There's two of them here, and we know that the charges of the two hydrogens plus the charge of sulfur have to equal the charge on the whole thing right here, and whatever hydrogen is plus whatever sulfur is has to add up to equal a neutral compound, so it's got to add up to equal zero. So what must sulfur be in this case? Sulfur's got to be minus two to balance out the positive two right there. S8, this is called an allotrope of sulfur. Sulfur actually has a couple of different allotropes, and this is the one that's actually the most common in the world, S by itself has eight a ring, an, a ring of eight sulfurs stuck together. And since it's in its elemental form, it has an oxidation number of zero. SCL2, well, sulfur, we don't know its oxidation number at all. We do or can make an educated guess that chlorine is going to have a minus one oxidation number. Remember how I said these guys are almost always minus one? And unfortunately, you won't like to hear this, sometimes there's not a hard and fast rule and you have to make an educated guess. And since these guys are almost always minus one, let's guess that chlorine's minus one. And there's two of those because there's a small two below the chlorine. And it has to add up to equal the charge on the whole thing. So it equals zero. So what must sulfur's charge be? In this case, it must be positive two. So we've seen sulfur be negative two. We've seen it be zero. We've seen it be positive two. Does that tell you that oxidation numbers can change? Well, if it hasn't, it should now. Lastly, letter D, or second to last. Sodium's charge, we can guess that's positive one because it's in group one. There's two of them right here. Sulfur's oxidation number number we don't know. Oxygen's oxidation number we know is almost always minus two and there happen to be three of them and we know that that whole thing has got to sum to zero. That whole thing has got to sum to zero. So positive two plus some number plus negative six is equal to zero. That means sulfur must be posi four. Hey, now we've seen sulfur be negative two, zero, positive two, positive four. Yup, sulfur is one of those things that can change oxidation numbers a lot. Guess what sulfur's oxidation number is in SO4? I'm going to write it right up here because i got a little more room. Sulfur, we don't know. Oxygen's minus two, and there's four of them, and it's got to sum up to be negative two because the charge on this ion is negative two. So something plus negative eight equals negative two. It's got to be posi six. And yes, lo and behold, folks, we went from negative two to zero to positive two to positive four for this one to positive six for this one. And sulfur can be any of those oxidation numbers depending on what it is combined with.
Sample exercise 4.9. Write the balanced molecular and net ionic equation for the reaction of aluminum with hydrobromic acid. Identify what is oxidized and what is reduced. So first we take aluminum and write it as Al. Next we write hydrobromic acid. Hey, that should ring a bell. That's a strong acid, right? And then we recognize that this is what's called a single replacement reaction, where aluminum is going to come over here and replace the positive ion in HBr. Aluminum separates the H and the Br, giving us H by itself. And remember, H is one of those special elements that's called a diatomic. And when it's alone by itself, it exists as H2. And then aluminum will be with bromine. And aluminum has a plus 3 charge, bromine a minus 1 charge. And we drop and swap those charges, and we end up with AlBr3. We're supposed to write the balanced equation here. We're going to end up needing three bromines right here. And uh, that's going to make it kind of tricky because if I put a 3 in front of here, I've got an odd number of hydrogens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double this right away. And I'm going to make it so now I have 6 bromines. So I've got to put a 6 in front here, which means I've got to put a 3 right here. And that forces me to put a 2 in front of the aluminum. So 2, 6, 3, 2 turns out to be my balanced chemical equation. Now it says to write the net ionic equation for this. Aluminum, well... That's just going to stay as aluminum because it's aluminum solid. HBr, I can split that up because that is a strong acid. So split it up into 6 H plus and 6 Br minus. Make sure to split that uh, and distribute the 6 because the 6 speaks to both of those things. 3 H2, well, that's just a gas. So we're just going to leave that together. And then AlBr3, it, uh, if it's soluble, of course, we're going to split it up. And of course, all bromides are soluble. So don't forget to distribute this and we'll end up with 2 Al plus 3s and distribute the 2 in here. So now I have 2 times 3 or 6 Br minuses. Notice how I took the 3 times the 2 right here and brought it out front because I can't say that there's 2 Br 3s because there's no such thing as a Br 3 for a polyatomic ion. Anything to cross out? Yep, looks like the uh, Br minuses are just going to spectate. And so it turns out that Al plus 6H plus goes to hydrogen gas and aluminum. Now, they wanted to know what is oxidized and what is reduced. Well, we haven't really gone into what is oxidation and what is reduction that much here, so this is a good time. The good, um, there's several good ways to remember this, but oxidation is the loss of electrons, and reduction is the gain of electrons. And remember, electrons have a negative one charge. So if you're gaining electrons, remember you're going to end up more negative. And if you lose electrons, remember you're going to end up more positive because you're losing a negative one thing. And a minus, a minus, of course, is positive. So what's a good way to remember this? Oil rig is one good way. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons. That's one good way. Or Leo the lion goes grr is another good way to remember it. Loss of electrons is oxidation. Gain of electrons is reduction. You know, whichever one you like, you can go ahead and help and remember. I just like to remember that when I'm oxidized, I'm going to go up in charge. Okay, it just works for me. Whatever works for you is fine too. So let's look at what happens from one side to the other. Aluminum here, of course, has an oxidation number of zero because it's by itself. Over here, it becomes positive three. So that means it must have lost some electrons to become more positive. That means it's oxidized. So aluminum is my thing that's oxidized. And oxidation and reduction always happens in pairs. So once you know one of them, of course, you know the other. But let's just prove it to ourselves. This one's plus one, and it goes to under the oxidation number of zero and going from plus one to zero means that it is reduced or going down in charge. So that means my hydrogen is reduced. Let's look at the second example here. It says write the balanced molecular and net ionic equations for the reaction between magnesium and cobalt 2 sulfate. So magnesium is Mg, cobalt is CO, and it's cobalt 2, so put a plus 2 up there. And sulfate is SO4, and I know that has a minus 2 charge, so when I drop and swap, I'll get rid of the 2s. 
Aero with another single replacement reaction here where magnesium is going to come over here and replace cobalt. We can call them single replacement reactions, but we know we're changing the charge, so actually a single replacement is a form of redox or oxidation reduction reaction. So we're going to end up with magnesium together here with sulfate. Magnesium has a plus two charge normally. If I forgot what that is, look at where magnesium is on the periodic table. Magnesium has a plus two charge because it's in group two. Sulfate, you know, of course, you have memorized as a minus two charge. And then cobalt's going to be off alone by itself. Kind of sad. Cobalt over here will have a charge of zero. Magnesium, of course, has a charge of plus two right here and had a charge of zero. So you could figure out what's oxidized and what's reduced right now. Magnesium went from zero to plus two, so it is oxidized. Cobalt went from um, plus two to zero, so it is re um, it is reduced. It went from positive two to zero over here. Uh, that's the next question, actually, they're going to ask. But let's write the uh, net ionic. Let's keep the magnesium by itself because it's a solid. And then cobalt sulfate, soluble, so cobalt plus two. And um, the reason we know it's uh, it, it's uh, uh, soluble is because all sulfates are soluble except for fabs, and that's not one of fabs. And then SO4, which is minus two. Magnesium sulfate, another soluble thing. All sulfates are soluble except for um, fabs, and so that's plus two. And then sulfate is SO4 minus two. Oh, by the way, if you forgot what fabs was, I probably have that around here somewhere. Fabs, of course, for sulfates were lead, mercury, silver, barium, and strontium, but you probably have those notes somewhere. All sulfates are soluble except for those five things. And of course, cobalt and uh, magnesium are not one of those five things. So we split those up, and then we put cobalt off by itself because that's going to be a solid. And that has a zero oxidation number. Anything cross off? Yep, looks like the sulfates go away. So don't write the sulfates in the net ionic equation because they just spectate and do nothing. So anyway, what's oxidized, what's reduced? We said magnesium went from zero to plus two, so that means magnesium is oxidized, went up in charge, and then uh, cobalt went from plus two down to zero, so we say that cobalt is reduced in charge. Well, next, using table 4.5 on page 143, identify which is more easily reduced, magnesium plus two or nickel plus two. Well, We've been talking about how magnesium right here is oxidized by cobalt, and cobalt is, as a matter of fact, reduced by magnesium. And we also saw up here how aluminum was oxidized by hydrogen. Well, how do we know that these things actually happen? Scientists have tabulated and put together a list of what are called reduction potentials. Reduction potentials actually tell you the potential that something is reduced, and this is simplified for us in Chapter 4 into something known as an activity series. And if you look Look on the top page 143 right here, you can see that this is an activity series of metals. You can see lithium way up here at the top, and this is one of the most easily oxidized things. And then you look way down here at the bottom, gold is one of the least easily oxidized things way down here at the bottom. And you can see that this blue arrow right here says ease of oxidation increases. So things up here will be very, very easily oxidized, and conversely down here, things down here will be very, very easily reduced, which is the opposite of every one of these reactions. They write these reactions as all oxidation, where something is losing an electron. If you'll notice, it goes from lithium to lithium plus two plus an electron. They write electrons as little e's. That means that they're losing those electrons. So the question that we're trying to answer right here on the paper is, using this table, identify which is more easily reduced, magnesium or nickel. And of course, they're written as magnesium plus two or nickel plus two, because because they're going to be reduced, and reduction is the gain of electrons. So we're actually going to look at the backwards of these reactions. So here's magnesium right here. And the second one that they're asking is um, ni uh, nickel, nickel plus two. And if we find nickel on here, it's right down here. And they ask, which one is the most easily reduced? Well, it's kind of an opposite question of what the table says, because oxidation increases as you go up, so that means reduction possibility increases as you go down. So who's lower on the chart? Well, nickel is. So nickel is going to be the one that has the most possibility of being reduced, because it's lower on the activity series chart. In chapter 20, we'll actually learn uh, uh, about the, um, uh, the backwards of this chart, which is known as the um, 
the uh, reduction potential table, but for right now, we can just use this table, table 4.5, as called the activity series to determine which things most easily oxidized and which things most easily reduced. So sample exercise 410, using table 4.5, will an aqueous solution of iron 2 chloride, so that would be FeCl2, uh, I, I, into chloride oxidize magnesium metal. So magnesium metal here is Mg. If so, write the balanced molecular and net ionic equations. So what we want to know is that can this iron come over here and oxidize magnesium to make magnesium become its ion? And if you look on the periodic table, magnesium is one of those elements that's way over here in group two, so it's going to form a plus two charged ion. So if it can do it, it's going to form Mg plus two, and then we're going to end up with um, iron off um, by itself as a zero charged thing. And of course, our, our uh, chlorine will spectate. It's actually going to end up being over here with the uh, magnesium is MgCl2, but you'll see that that's soluble and they'll actually end up spectating. So anyway, let's answer the question. Can iron make magnesium oxidize? Well, first of all, where's iron on the chart? Well, iron's right here. I'll put a little black line by it right here. And then where's magnesium? Magnesium's right here. And of course, Ease of oxidation increases as you move up the charge. Uh, move up the chart. Is magnesium more easily oxidized than iron? Yes, because it's higher on the chart. And so, yes, as a matter of fact, magnesium can, I mean, sorry, iron can go over here and cause magnesium to become magnesium plus two. So, finishing the equation right here, FeCl2 plus magnesium would form Fe. Uh, by itself, and MgCl2. Uh, this is soluble, so I'll break that up into Fe plus 2 plus 2 Cl minus. Leave the magnesium by itself because it's an elemental substance, and so it has an oxidation number of 0. This forms Fe. Leave it by itself. It has an oxidation number of 0. And then over here, we're going to have the Mg plus 2 and 2 Cl minuses. Notice the Cl minuses cancel each other out, and we end up with these guys being the net ionic equation. One more problem like that where we get to look at that chart. Take a look at practice exercise 410. It says using table 4.5, which of the following metals will be oxidized by Pb NO3 2. So what we're really asking is lead, which is posi 2 right here inside of lead nitrate, will lead uh, be able to oxidize zinc, copper, or iron. So zinc would oxidize, of course, to its Zn plus 2 state. Copper would oxidize to either copper plus 1 or copper plus 2. And iron would oxidize to either iron plus 2 or plus 3. So what we need to know is, are these guys above lead on the chart and therefore more easily oxidized? So where's lead on the chart? Lead's right here. And the things that we're looking for are zinc. I'll just put a little star by that one. So that one is possible uh, to be to be able to be oxidized by lead. Copper, uh-oh, copper's down below. So no, 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 it can't be oxidized because remember, ease of oxidation increases as you go up. And then lastly, iron, which is up here as well. So iron could be oxidized as well. Good luck with your redox reactions.